banking TARDIS. Here we are. Isn't this beautiful? I get a proper, proper fanboy thrill when I come here. I do have to say, this isn't my TARDIS. I had a, be a different TARDIS that it was absolutely gorgeous. But uh, this is Peter Capaldi's, and it's stunning. Look at me, I'm being a Time Lord. <laughs> I just want to pull levers and fly to Mars. I love it. Where should we go? Gallifrey. Let's get those bastards. In 2005, after a 16-year hiatus, Doctor Who returned to our screens in a new series with Russell T. Davis as lead writer and executive producer. A lifelong Whovian himself, Russell now had the privilege and the challenge of reimagining the show for a new generation. It's literally one of my earliest memories. It is my earliest memory of childhood. I remember William Hartnell regenerating into, into Patrick Troughton, which is an episode that's missing from the archives now, and it's in my head. I literally know what happened in it. And you look at the dates, and I was three then, so it's a very, very early memory branded into me, and I watched it for all those years, and I never fell out of love with it, and to bring it back was a privilege. It's just my favourite show in the world. What's that like? The heart of the TARDIS. This ship's alive. You've opened its soul. Let's talk about Doctor Who. Why did you particularly want to do that? You were on a, you were on a crest of a wave as a writer Yes, a lot of people said you're mad. Yeah. It's simply because I loved it. And that's a great start to a project, working on something that you love. And, and I, knew, I knew I could make it work. I wasn't certain it would work, you know, because the, the, the people might have just said, no, no thanks. You can never tell quite what the flavour of the nation is that week. But um, I knew I could make a version that worked. Um, and I, I really felt this was, but, but anyway, but simply, I, love, I could analyse this forever. It simply comes down to the fact that I loved it. I spent all those years when it was off air buying Doctor Who magazine. I used to sit and think about adventures in my head like I used to do when I was nine. They'd always been there and they'd never left. So it just made sense at the end. And technically, as a producer, I was very excited about the fact that television was then reaching the stage where it could tell these stories, where you didn't need £10 million per episode, where you could create spaceships in the computer and make it. So we had reached a new age. Its time was coming again. But how did you convince them that you were the person to do it? Actually, they, um, I was very lucky. All that previous work all kind of, kind of uh, accumulated, and they came to me, really. It was, I'd always knocked on the door. I'd associated my name with Doctor Who. It sounds like a big plan. It was just something that happened, but there was a lot of Doctor Who references in Queer as Folk. That, just in the heads of commissioners and executives, that made a link between me and the program. It sounds like a brilliant plan. It wasn't. It just happened. When you... Uh, decided, let's go with it. Did they say, no, I wanted to be up to date. No, I wanted to be different. No, I wanted to be unlike what it was before. Was any of that, did any of that go on? No, the marvellous thing was that that was all assumed in coming to me. In, in, in coming to me and asking Russell T. Davis to, to write Doctor Who, you're going to get my Doctor Who. I'm not going to do the old one. And I had a reputation, uh, you've been saying, a reputation for very real characters, for kind of witty characters, for an emotional truth, speed of drama, sort of narrative. Um, I, I proved that already, so that's what they wanted. They, it was astonishing how much freedom they gave me. They literally gave me the commission, and then I went to one of my first meetings at the BBC thinking, dreading it, thinking, oh, they're going to tell me to do this, tell me to do that, a whole list of instructions. And we got to the meeting, and the producers kind of went, right, so, how do you see it? What's it going to be? It's like, oh, it, it really is mine. With a script that Russell writes, you're just trying to match it. You're just trying to make your thoughts work quick enough, make your mouth work quick enough, make your wits dance cleverly enough to, to, to match his words. We're interrupting you. You're out at seven o'clock, so you've got to beam out to a lot of the mm. audience. You've got to shine, haven't you? That is, there's got to be the superficial shine. How did you go about that? It's the only thing I've made that's ever that's had the remit of, it's got to be popular, it's got to work. You're spending a lot of public money on this, and it's got to work, it's got to shine. So it's big, just thinking big all the time, just thinking, let's not be quiet, let's make it noisy. Those dubs are noisy on Doctor Who, the mixes are noisy, people complain about the sound, they complain the music to her, I don't care, it's noisy, it's brilliant. It blasts out of the television, demands you watch it. 
One thing that was very attractive was the way that the dialogue seemed to undercut the action, in the sense that the most fantastic thing is happening with that bag, and he'd come out and he'd say something like, oh, I really could do with a bag of chips. Yeah. I mean, it was something <laughs> like that, wasn't it? Exactly, exactly. And it's reveling, you know, one of the things I wanted to do, that's, I'd forgotten that, it was reveling the Britishness of it. Yeah. That's where Billy Piper was so hugely fundamental to that initial success, and Chris Exton, because both of them, so down to earth, no matter how highfalutin and fancy the plot gets. There's two characters you believe will go and sit in Nando's and have some chicken afterwards and just have a bit of a laugh and half a beer. It's, you know, there's something earthy and rooted about it. It's a great danger he can become a frock-coated loon just, 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 just giddying about the place without making contact with human life. You know, you've got to bring it down. And you think that's Britishness, do you? I think, I think, I think it could be, I think that could be done in America. But that's why I filled it with, in the first year, you've got Big Ben, you've got a spaceship flying into Big Ben, you've got Billy Piper in a Union Jack t-shirt in one episode. Let's wave a flag yeah. and then put Cardiff into it. That was especially fun. Let's put Wales <laughs> into it. <laughs> no one was expecting that. Being Welsh is such, it's so important to me and so neglected on screen for so long. And I've carried that with me, the, the, the fact that, that Wales isn't seen enough. And so it was all very well to make Doctor Who in Cardiff. It's no good having one successful show. We had to add to that. So we'd, we worked ourselves to death. It's like we then added Torchwood. We then added a children's version of these shows called the Sarah Jane Adventures, which I loved. And at one point, I was, we were making like Doctor Who, Doctor Who Confidential, Torchwood, Torchwood Declassified, totally Doctor Who for CBBC, um, uh, the Savage Jane Adventures, and all the website spin-offs, and animated stories. It was a factory. But the whole point of that factory was that now, you go to Cardiff, there's an entire studio which had been built to make these, which didn't exist in 2005. It's built in Cardiff Bay, and it wouldn't have been built if we didn't get so much work into the city. So it's a power base. It's, it's work. What we're talking about are jobs for people, for hundreds and hundreds of people in Cardiff. And that's a brilliant thing. That's the point in the end. After two Doctors, four series, and multiple spin-offs, Russell had achieved everything he'd set out to do with the show, and he handed over the reins. He turned Doctor Who into a global phenomenon and won a batch of awards, including a BAFTA for Best Drama Series. Who's your favourite? All of them, all of them. I like an ood. Were you worried that you could ever be as successful at anything ever again after your time on Doctor Who? Because it was, I and mean, we mustn't let that go, that comment. It was stupendous. Well, it show. was insane. It was also kind of, I mean, yes, it was lovely. It was brilliant. It was mad. I can't, I'm still coming to terms with it. I still, I still get stopped in the street almost every day. Actually, I say almost every day, and that's me being self-deprecating. Every single day, I'm still stopped in the street for an autograph. Every day. And I left it in 2010. Stopped in the street and asked for an autograph, which is lovely. And brilliant. what a compliment that is. But I think for a writer, it's very strange. You know, let's be honest, it, I'm hardly Madonna. But I'm close. <laughs> I'm getting there, day by day. But imagine how strange that is. Writers are kind of meant to be invisible. Did you feel rather saturated by success in that sense? You kind of get drunk in it, can't yeah, you? Yeah, but it's not really, because you laugh at stuff like that, and then yeah. you go hand in your next script. If you're still working for the BBC, and you're on a budget, and it's in Cardiff, and, you know, <laughs> everything brings you down to it. The next day, you just open up a computer, and it's a day's work, like anything else. This is famously what Dylan Thomas called the ugly, lovely town of Swansea. I still think this place is beautiful. It's funny, as I get older, I come back to Swansea more and more often. You think you run away when you're young, you just end up being pulled back. This is my path home from school that I walked for seven years. Being a kid, I used to live so ferociously inside my head, so intensely. I used to hate if someone would join me walking home because I'd feel interrupted. I mean, literally thinking of stories and, and adventures. I think of Doctor Who stories. I'd walk along this path, wishing you could turn around a corner and see a TARDIS and just walk into it. I just imagine all these houses blowing up, science fiction stories. The strength with which they were flickering through my head is really strange to recall. Then you turn all that into your job. That's what's amazing. You'd never have dreamt you could have done that. 
street I grew up on, Long Kai Bank, which is Welsh for Field Bank Lane. This is the house. It's funny, because all my father ever wanted uh, for his children was a regular job. So when I became a writer, and, and uh, we never told him. We never told my father what my job was. And he'd see programmes with my name on, which obviously meant that I'd written it, but he didn't quite put two and two together. He thought I had a regular job that went to the office nine to five. He never knew I was free. My mother used to say, don't tell him. Don't tell him. He'll just nag me to death if he thinks you have got a proper job. He'd phone me. Sometimes he'd phone me. And he, I'd phone home in the middle of the day, and he'd say, where are you? And, I, and I'd go, I'm at home. I'd forget. I'd say, I'm at home. He'd go, what are you doing at home? Why at work? I'd say, I've just popped home to uh, something, uh, pick up a pen, and I'll go back now. His entire life, I lied to him about what my job was. That's terrible. <laughs> Russell's most recent project is a reworking of A Midsummer Night's Dream for the BBC. In adapting the play, he drew inspiration from more than 40 years ago, when his drama teacher cast him as bottom in the school play. Here she comes. Hello, darling. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello, I'm brilliant to see you. Ooh. 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 Come on, get it out of the cold. Ooh. How brilliant to Hi. see you. Fantastic. It meant the world to us, that production. Because for me, I think everything I've ever worked on ever since, I've tried to do along those lines to involve everyone, to get, and to get big laughs, and to get big reactions, to get people loving it, to get the family along. It, you can see that line all the way through to the Doctor Who's that I did and everything. And, and I love you for that. It's, 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 it's an absolutely unforgettable memory. Do you know what I remember more than anything? It's that wonderful enthusiasm. I drive up in the morning, and you'd be there just as I parked the car, this! <laughs> I've got a marvellous idea for this, that and the other, or I've written a piece, how about that? In my little and how about dress. that? You know, <laughs> absolutely, you know, the archetypal <laughs> bottom, you know. Was that really? Oh, that's so dreadful. I said, I've, I've, I've got the part for you. I've got the part for you. Right, OK. <laughs> And you'd look round, and you'd be swinging on a rope. You'd be. Oh, those are the uh, days. Can I come, yeah. <laughs> that would kill me now. Coming up and down. I, if I came down these bars and I did that, no, hang on a minute, Russell. I, I was unbearable. You just, no, you yes. were. It was just like I can't bear it was this. like dealing with, you know, this wonderful spark of. And I've always said that people think of you only really these days, isn't it, as the writer oh, yeah. and so on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But what an actor. There was no ego about you. You were just totally natural and wonderful. I think it's something that you have which is literally a gift. Uh, and you have absolutely used your gift. I'm so proud that you have. Oh, thank you. It was a huge moment in my life. I look at it now and in this version of Midsummer Night's Dream I've done for the BBC, it's like, you know, it didn't want to do those fairies. It didn't want fairies mm -hmm. flittering about in wings, mm -hmm. being all willowy and gossamery. Okay. It's, yes. And you had fairies, you had lads, the school lads mm -hmm. who had never been in a school play, mm -hmm. hanging off the bars in the gym mm -hmm. and, and, and leaping about, being tough and strong. Mm -hmm. And that's this version. When you see this version, it's like they're, they're real creatures that live in a forest. Mm -hmm. It's there. When you see it, mm -hmm. you will see your Midsummer Night's Dream 41 years later yeah. on BBC One. There's one